competition here with the with the Thursday night football and other events in your busy lives. So to come out and give three cheers for agrarian art and agriculture, I think it's pretty exciting. So thanks for being here. It's uh, it's a rather effusive title up there, isn't it? Pur purpose of existence. I mean, you know, we we, we might wonder just 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 how is that? And uh, so thanks for coming out tonight to, to explore such an important topic. Uh, a big thanks uh, to the Fort Walla Walla Museum, your society here. Karina, thank you. James uh, has helped us for a long time up in Tri-Cities with some of our work with the museum. I have a, a great respect for him and the work that you've championed here. And, uh, you know, I feel a little bit like a Walla Walla kid. I've known Charles and the family here for, for what seems like a lifetime. I, I came down here as a, as a kid. We were related to the Dipples and the Morashes and Eichlers, and I know there's all kinds of our uh, Russian-German folks who many of them inhabit a part of town. I, I'm not sure if you call it a Russian town or Russische Eka. Uh, but, you, you know, it's here, and I've been there uh, many times and enjoyed coming down. <clears throat> Can you hear me in the back? Is this okay? Okay. Uh, but uh, it's kind of like a homecoming in some ways, and I spent 35 years in public and private education and uh, uh, am delighted to have kind of settled here in semi-retirement up in the Tri-Cities where our three children seven grandchildren uh, reigning over all things we do, so I was able to sneak away from the ball games tonight and, uh, and uh, come down and take advantage of your kind hospitality. Uh, I'm really uh, pleased that we could gather with my good friend John Clements, a blood brother and a lot of these endeavors over many years. Uh, some books here tell about um, his good work. I, I, I kidnapped John. About 15 years ago, we took a trip to Eastern Europe, and uh, I was sitting with him on the airplane. And I, I thought, wow, I'm with John Clement for eight hours on this flight. What, what, what can I do? I can pester him. Hours. How many? 27, 27 hours. 27 hours. No wonder it's such a great book. Uh, yeah, so I decided I'm going to pester him with all the questions that I always wanted to ask about how do you turn taking pictures into a career? Uh, it's fascinating. So anyway, that, that led to, uh, to this book, Northwest uh, Drylands, and uh, one of several here that we've collaborated with over the years. <coughs> and, uh, and it's uh, for all of you at any age that want to take this up, John is incredibly generous with his wisdom. And, uh, and uh, it, it, it is remarkable that uh, landscape art can, can become a profession to give such meaning and enriches so many other people's lives. Um, our topic uh, is, is one of many. Uh, of course, it relates to the special significance of our area of the inland Pacific Northwest. And I'm fascinated by a vast realm of topics uh, that, that relate to our region. <clears throat> but I'm going to uh, confine as best I can uh, what I have to say to the title and theme that you see on the overhead because it's a lot to it's a lot to unpack and I'll try to share with you the highlights here in 20 and 25 minutes pass over to John he's got a few things to share with you about uh, the genesis of his work with this project and uh, you know I'm an old junior high high school teacher so I got to have show and tell right <laughs> and uh, I told all our candidates for years at Seattle Pacific University uh, you know they're all into all these weird exciting computer technologies, and, and I'm, I'm telling them, never give short shrift to show and tell, you know, <laughs> dot to dot, all that good time-honored stuff. So uh, these are some actual pieces here that we'll be showcasing. This is the first public showing ever, uh, for me, of uh, what in our collection is, uh, is an actual Rembrandt. And so that's not something that always makes its appearance here in the, in the Pacific Northwest, but I'm glad that you're the you're the inaugural group here. This is my first chance to really uh, share this uh, particular theme, and I, I hope you find it interesting. Alex McGregor has collaborated with us on many projects and uh, has some family obligations. 
so we're not certain if Alex is going to make it or not, uh, but uh, you're invited on, I think, October 19th. We'll be doing a similar program at the museum in Pasco <coughs> at 7 o'clock as part of the Washington Humanities Program. And, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll all be there for that as well. Um, okay, so here we go. Agrarian art and the purpose of existence. Uh, that, that picture up there is of special significance to me. Uh, I'll have to tell a story, not, not especially adulatory about myself. This, uh, the genesis of this project to me was about eight years ago. And uh, I, I saw this very picture at the Washington State Fair in Puyallup. They had a kind of, many of you have been there, have been to the State Fair, and you know, it's just a big event, and uh, a lot of buildings there. I've, I've seen John there with his displays, and uh, anyway, eight years ago I show up, and, and uh, there, there's a, a building that is, is, has kind of a rummage sale. And uh, it's a fundraiser thing for the fair. So you can, you know, buy lots of peculiar things. And so there was a whole table filled with old postcards. And I'm coming through these postcards, just a little time to kill. And this, this very image by uh, an artist named Robert Atkinson Fox was in the pie. And, uh, you know, I saw it kind of, kind of struck me. Uh, to this day, I don't know why I didn't pick it up. It was probably 25 cents. And I was, Richard was too cheap to pick up this postcard. So I put it back and uh, had my annual corn dog, like some of you do when you go to the fair, and, and drove home. <laughs> and on the way home, this just bothered me that something so stunningly beautiful Costing so little, uh, I passed on. Now, if you've ever parked at the State Fair, you realize it's, it's quite a job if you wanted to go back and do something again. So I did not break the traffic, uh, but I couldn't get that image out of my mind. And to this day, I, I'm not exactly sure uh, everything about its significance. I hope you find it something beautiful. Uh, I've spent uh, eight years since then trying to unpack the significance of what's depicted in that image and uh, have, have, have written uh, now three volumes uh, chronologically going back to ancient of days, Old Testament stories of Ruth and Boaz and the Old Testament and the uh, Karina here, I'll see if I can get this to operate for us. Don't worry, folks. Well, try the other clicker. There, there you go. go. This is a Polish ethnographer who I think had, she, I'm not sure she's ever seen the fox image, but had she seen it, I, I can tell by what she writes that she uh, identifies with, with, with this truth. Harvest, she writes, since the dying immemorial was understood in ritual terms as the principal duty in humanity's relationship with Mother Earth. This was essentially the purpose of existence. I, I made a light a little bit of the fact that, you know, we can be doing other things tonight, right? We can be going to a ball game or watching a TV program. And, and, uh, and, and, and these are all worthwhile uh, things. But our fast-paced 21st century life has become increasingly disconnected from fundamental values that have sustained society since time immemorial. And one point I'd like to share with you tonight is, is that we, we do that at our own risk. Some people get it. I, I think you do. You, you live here in this beautiful valley of Walla Walla. And, and you recognize the importance of agriculture. People talk about agriculture and farming almost, almost like it's, uh, you know, an animal or something. Uh, 
Oddly, uh, and by the way, our founders knew this, George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, a lot of people don't know that Benjamin Franklin was a farmer. They know all about flying a kite and discovering electricity, but uh, Franklin wrote approvingly of farming, had farmland, <coughs> certain Thomas Jefferson, <coughs> others. They recognize it supports all of society and civilization. Well, they know this up the road, too. And I think I saw this at Wakesburg last week. Was driving by, passed out through town, and saw, saw the sign on the road by that nice uh, little restaurant there. And I flipped at UE, don't tell the cops up there on the highway, but I had to get back and, and, and just, just look at this. And, uh, and you know what? It's true. Farming is. Farming is the backbone of community. We live in a day when a lot of things are measurable. Success is to be determined by measurables. So I, I took a look at this the other day just to find out how important is agriculture to where we live. Just take the 10 counties of southeastern Washington. That's just a small slice from Walla Walla over to the Yakima area. Six and a half billion dollars in annual crop value added to an additional 3.4 billion in food processing revenue means that we represent in agriculture for the Pacific Northwest and nation, 10 billion dollars in revenue. Uh, if you're, by the way, I consider eating an agricultural act. So <laughs> since we're all in the farming world, I think we can all pat ourselves on the back and say a special thank you to those who are actively engaged in farming because it's a, it's a pretty impressive uh, number. And in fact, that represents a larger payroll than Boeing and Microsoft put together. So interesting that we have that kind of significance for our specific region. I think it's worth celebrating. And I decided it would be interesting to look back at how this is expressed aesthetically in art and literature for uh, the book series that John and I and others have been uh, working on. And, uh, and here, here we have in the 16th century these beautiful woodcuts hand-colored woodcuts that go back to this period within the first century of, of, the, of the printing press being invented uh, in, uh, in, in Germany. So we're, we're you know, I, I think of some significance even looking at the fact that when artists and authors first wanted to depict representations of meaning, be they in art, painting, engravings, short stories, poetry, they selected themes of agriculture and harvest. It goes back far beyond that to this period in Old Testament times and even before the story of Ruth and Boaz. Ruth, this penniless traveler from Moab seen as a stranger to the people of Israel but taken into the fold because of Boaz's generosity and provides a context for lessons on divine deliverance in times of injustice, a theme also, to my mind, of special significance for our day. A century later, in the 16 and 1700s, we see even a finer use of, uh, of engraving methods. Woodcuts, as I said, came soon uh, after the invention uh, of Gutenberg's printing press. And so we see beautiful images that emerge from this period of time. And, uh, and the, the addition of color and uh, details, and, and no surprise, a lot of what we see were these beautiful, if somewhat idealistic, representations from classical literature, uh, Greek and Roman stories, as well as uh, the Old and New Testaments. 
Interestingly enough, they, they often dress Ruth and Boaz in the clothes of whatever century they're living in. So, you know, these, these really aren't probably as, as they might have looked in ancient times, but it shows us a lot about the significance of that story. It also shows us something about how important it was to the people who, uh, who created these images at the time. And we're not just talking about obscure names of artists and authors that, that you might not be acquainted with. What we find is that uh, the greatest artists of the age invested time in these very images. So we have Peter Paul Rubens here in the 17th century, man threshing, he's famous. Uh, he was, he was uh, uh, from the Netherlands, a Dutch court painter, but in those days, Spain controlled what is today uh, uh, the Netherlands, Holland, and so he was the court painter. Look at the energetic view here of the thresher. By the way, I think I saw in your museum here last year when I was making the rounds that you have a flail somewhere. Isn't it interesting that the flails used to thresh the grain we see as referenced in Old Testament times all the way up to basically our grandparents' generation. You know, it wasn't until the invention of mechanized threshing in the 1800s, and you have the masterful example here in your museum of that uh, enormous pressure you built the, uh, the uh, I don't know how many horses are there to pull it, I think it's a 30 horse mule or a 36 mule uh, hitch is, uh, is remarkable. But from then backwards to time immemorial, this was an incredibly physical experience. <coughs> Rembrandt is mostly known for his uh, scenes of prominent people. And, and let's face it, a lot of these people that are court painters, you know, they're paid to create portraits of famous people who can spend money on, on their portraits. But what is it they want to do themselves? When they have free time, they paint scenes of agrarian experience. I find that uh, especially interesting. So this is from a copper plate that was engraved uh, by Rembrandt, and uh, he goes down in history to our day as being the most important engraver, the most skilled engraver of all time. Francisco Pisano gives us a look in the 16th century of the importance of realistic scenes. When, when you look at the paintings of uh, uh, the, the, the great Renaissance artists, Michelangelo, da Vinci, and others, you know, that often you'll, you'll see landscapes kind of in the background, uh, Sistine Chapel, you've seen pictures of these. Th these are imaginary places. Th th these aren't real. They, they didn't really go to the Holy Land and, and find the scene. They, they conjured up images in their imagination, and they did it in brilliant ways. Bassano says, uh, you know, hey, look, Look outside. Look at the landscapes of Italy. Look at the landscapes of Germany. Look at the landscapes of Walla Walla. There is great beauty and significance in reality. We need not just imagine these. And then in the 17th century, we also have the very first art catalog ever created and uh, once again, we'll look what they're uh, giving examples of. They're, giving, they're, they're using agrarian experience to fill the pages of this work. By the way, these are all works <coughs> that we've acquired for what we call the Columbia Heritage Collection. We don't really know what we're going to do with these. Uh, maybe WSU, we'd like to share them here with you, or museums in Tri-Cities. Uh, as fun as it is to put them up here on the screen, it's really kind of exciting to tangibly go and be able to, to see them in person. Well, coffee table books. That's what John does so wonderfully, right? And you've got coffee table books at home. Uh, you know, maybe it celebrates the valley, maybe it celebrates the Cougar football team. I'm trying to do my part for that. Uh, you know, whatever we do. Uh, the very first coffee table book in existence 
uh, was, uh, was this work by, uh, uh, commissioned by Richard Erlen, uh, and John Boydell was a great etcher, a favorite, by the way, of George Washington. If you've ever been to Mount Vernon, you see those beautiful black and white images on the entry room, in the entry room. Those are John Boydell prints. And, uh, and he created this beautiful work, Liber Veritatis, in the late 18th century <laughs> that ultimately, I guess, became history because everybody then started doing coffee table books. And here's where it all started with farming. <clears throat> the first commercial lithograph, which is the process of making copies off a flat stone, a porous stone that you can put ink and colors and, uh, and pull off the print, <clears throat> was this one in the early 1800s. And then a very famous artist, uh, to this day, by the way, when they take polls in, in England, Great Britain, who, who's your favorite artist? This might not be a name known to a lot of us here in the United States. But, uh, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is like, uh, uh, in, I guess, the United States, if you had to name a famous artist, Andy Warhol, something like that, this on everybody's lips. Uh, in, in England, they named John Constable. <clears throat> to this day, he's considered the most popular painter. By the way, he was in the news last year. In, anybody, for not a good reason. Anybody know what happened? There was a group of people very concerned about damage to the global environment and how the Western world was substantially responsible and not doing enough about it. And so they glued themselves to the frames of constable paintings in the British National Gallery in London because they knew if you touch a constable, guess what? You're going to get people's attention. Well, they did. They also got thrown in jail, so you've got to be careful to do with John Constable. <clears throat> in any event, uh, this engraving uh, that was done by David Lucas after a Constable painting is considered the finest mesotint, which is, which is using a, a blurred, uh, a blurring tool to create a kind of three-dimensional effect uh, upon a lithograph. This one I like. Uh, it's a little bit later here, moving up to the 19th century. Uh, you know, we hear a lot of criticism many times about, uh, about agriculture, and, and some is justified. Uh, but, you know, one, one criticism we hear is that, well, the advent of farming technology put a lot of people out of work, and, and, it, and it relegated the life of the family uh, sort of irrelevant because we didn't need women and children anymore. Uh, well, many of you are farmers, and, or you're related to farmers, and if you're, and we're celebrating post-harvest time here. If you've ever been out in the field, let me tell you, it wouldn't exist without women and children, right? They, to this day, still uphold their end of the bargain, and I like this Albert Capus image, because if you look close there with the chickens and the dogs, look at, you know, there's... There, uh, thanks, Karina. I forgot you gave me a tool here. Look, we got the kids playing around. And look who's on top feeding the threshing machine. It's the ladies doing the work. So it's a conscious decision what you want to do with technology. Fortune magazine, I thought was a finance magazine. Uh, I told you that I passed on the 25 cent postcard. I'm still ashamed of myself. Later on, I did find a copy somewhere. I probably had to pay more than 25 cents, but, but I found it somewhere. Uh, what really got me started was a year or so after that, I was on the board of the State Historical Society in Tacoma, a beautiful museum there, and we break for lunch. Uh, we go across the street, and there's uh, kind of this industrial district, kind of, you know, where the University of Washington campus, Tacoma, is located. And, uh, and they, they have some kind of industrial looking cafes actually. And went over there to get a sandwich. And uh, at my table, uh, at all the tables, are old magazines just spread all over the place. And uh, on my table was this image on the top left. Fortune Magazine was an art magazine when it was founded in the 30s and 40s. It's not exclusively art, but art and finance. 
And the middle section was printed on very heavy paper for art collectors. And I, I, I was as stunned by that as I was by the Atkinson Fox image. And when I went up to pay my bill, I asked the proprietor, I said, you know, somebody's going to drop mayonnaise or mustard on this thing. You can just have it out here in the middle of the table. And uh, would you be willing to sell this? And uh, well, yeah, you know, for whatever the cost of your sandwich is, you can have this thing. <clears throat> so, so this image on the top left, that started me down the road of this project. And seven, eight years later, I'm here with the opportunity to share it with you. Part of the joy of encountering fine agrarian art is that you run onto surprises you can't find anywhere else. You can't find this in the Smithsonian. You can't find this in the British National Gallery. There are one-of-a-kind prints that, for whatever reason, as exquisite as they are, as they are, uh, all copies have been lost and uh, and uh, or or for whatever reason destroyed. Fantastic modern work by artists like Rockwell Kent, who, who really created an entire genre in the mid-20th century. And I'm really pleased that our Washington Association of Grain Growers, Wheat Growers, some of you might be members, uh, know the significance of fine art. And so if you join at uh, the highest level of the association, uh, you know, they, they provide you with uh, limited edition uh, lithograph. Most of these have been done by Karen Reffitt, but uh, there are a couple other artists that have contributed to these. I, I think they're just uh, treasures, and uh, they're based in Ritzville, uh, but uh, a wonderful, a wonderful work that they do. Alex McGregor and John Clement have been uh, close friends to me for uh, for many years. Uh, what's essentially become a lifetime. And uh, I'm really pleased that, uh, that John is with me. Uh, Karina, can we have the lights up by chance? I was going to uh, uh, kind of coast through a few pictures here while John has a chance to tell how this incredible project came to pass that he launched with Alex and Alex's father, uh, Sherman McGregor, some years ago. It's turned into, uh, in my estimation, uh, high-class fine art. And many of you have seen John's calendars over the years, or you've looked on his website. Uh, I was telling Karina a little earlier, he's a modest guy, so I'll have to stand here and brag for you, uh, because uh, he's a member of the National Photographers Hall of Fame, and uh, his, his work is, is just stunning. I used to think that, uh, oh, you know, get up early, press a button, big deal, you know, I, you know, I'm doing the hard work here. I'm having to write all these stories. <clears throat> and then I started following him around. And uh, yeah, you gotta get up at three in the morning. And uh, by the way, good luck if you go to bed at three at night the next day, because uh, he's there to find the right light in the most obscure places. And, uh, and, and no wonder he creates uh, these treasures. And uh, so we've been working on these things for some years. And uh, please welcome with me uh, my good friend John Clement to tell a little about the calendar. John. And I didn't know why I was going to talk. So I was just uh, the sideline guy. But it started in 1983, actually 82, I was invited by an art group to do a show in Moscow, Idaho, and I'd never been to the Palouse. And so on my drive over, on the show started on Tuesday, so I drove over <coughs> the Wednesday, or Monday morning afternoon to set up, and that was my first experience in the Palouse. And it just kind of blew my mind to see this landscape. And so early the next morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, I was out. And to date, the first picture I took is called Palouse Country Barn. And uh, the barn is still standing. It's been through several hands since then. And it was actually a cover of one of my, one of my calendars in 1985. But anyway, to make a long story short, uh, Sherman McGregor happened to come into the mall with his wife shopping. And you know how men do when they go to the mall, they kind of, OK, dear, you go do that, and I'm just going to walk. And I ran into Sherman there, and he saw the pictures. And he said, handed me his card, said, come by my office in Makanima. 
Uh, when you get done with the show, I need to talk to you about doing some work for me. So I went by the office and he said, I want to do a calendar. And I had my Northwest Drylands calendar. That was the very first year I did it was in 1983. And I think in 1985 is when we did the first McGregor calendar. And uh, it's, it's been history ever since. We've been doing it almost every year with the exception of about a seven year period of time when Alex said, yeah. uh, we're not gonna do calendars this year, we're gonna do knives. <laughs> <laughs> and that went over like a lead balloon. And, but he had, a, he had a five year commitment to do knives with a, a, a friend of his. And then the calendars resurrected themselves in the early 2000s again. So we've been doing that all along. And I just sent uh, Alex and uh, his son and Linda Becker, who kind of runs the whole operation, uh, the set of images for the calendar for next year. And they'll be available to McGregor outlets. And I may actually get some to the bookstore if I have any left. I do very, very limited production, usually Alex's, and then I use the remainder as fundraisers for our Rotary groups in the Tri-Cities. And they just, they sell it amongst the Rotarians and businesses in the Tri-Cities to raise money for various nonprofits in the Tri-Cities. And that's how the calendar started. And then I ran, well, Richard ran into me in 19, 93 at the Wenatchee Valley Apple Blossom Festival and he came up to me and stuck out his big hand and said, guess what, we're going to dance together. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. <laughs> and then he explained that he was a writer and that is the rest of that is history. We did the Palouse Country book and uh, it was uh, unbeknownst to him, I was ready to print a huge volume of them, and he said, no, we only need 1,500. I don't want them in my garage for the next 30 years. And so I convinced him to do uh, 5,000, and uh, I said, we'll pay for it in six months. And that's what happened. Somebody gave the book to the editor of the Seattle Times Magazine, who was a cougar. <laughs> and he contacted me and he said, this is amazing. I want to do a one-page article about your book. He said, send me your favorite picture. And I said, I can't send you the favorite one. I'll send you 10 you pick your favorite. <laughs> well, that went from a one-page article to a four-page full-color article on the Blues Country book. It was gone in six months. And I handed him a very hefty check for his portion of the book, and his complaint was, you put me in a new tax bracket. <laughs> so, so we had a lot of adventures together. The, the art book that he is talking about is uh, a huge project that he's been working on, and I'm just kind of in the background. He convinced me to go to Russia with him, and he booked uh, places in all these museums where a lot of this artwork was and he'd pay the curator some extra money so we could go opposite of what the tours were doing. The tours usually go in the museum and they go left and they go all around the museum. Well, we'd go in and we'd go right. So we could access a lot of the artwork and not be bothered with people interfering with us documenting some of the pieces that he wanted to photograph. And that was a wonderful adventure. Um, in the Sochi, Russia, and Berry Meadow, very, very remote area where his ancestry came from. He tried to convince me to go five years earlier, and I didn't go, and I guess I'm kind of glad because it took him three days of mud roads to get there. <laughs> I'll let him share that story. Uh, my work is, is, I've got a collection here. We, this is the result of the trip to Russia. Uh, he kept giving me these little glasses of wine as we're flying on the plane, trying to stay awake, and he'd have all these questions. And when I read the manuscript, um, I told him that, uh, no, no, everybody know, that knows me know that is not true. Alex liked to embellish a little bit, and so he had to go back and do some re-editing to bring it back down to earth. And it's, 
I have been doing all my own marketing with this stuff. It's like a Palouse Country book. Uh, on this edition, these are really the only three copies left of the books. I happened to be going through the garage about uh, four years ago, and my wife said, you've got to clean out that one section over there. I'd like to park in the garage. <laughs> and since we bought the house, she still has only parked in the garage once, because that's my work area. And hiding down in the corner were four boxes of these that got misplaced. And these are the last three out of those four boxes. But Richard is going to do it again. And the Palouse Country book, a newer version of it, is going to be printed. I don't know how soon that's going to take place, but it's, it's in the works right now. And uh, I'm going to, uh, since these books were released, I probably have another three or 4,000 Palouse pictures and Eastern Washington pictures that I've accumulated that I think are probably better than some of the images and here are some of the places I've been. My whole career has been, you know, photographing the land. Uh, when I first came back to the Tri-Cities in 1985, uh, right out of college, I'm a geologist by education. Uh, a friend of mine called me from Portland, Oregon while I was interviewing with the Australian government to be an exploratory geologist in Western Australia. And I was two weeks away from the signing of the final documents to go there for five years. And my friend Gary called me and said, you like to take pictures, don't you? And I said, yeah, I, I know how to pick up a camera. He said, well, they're interviewing for photography jobs here. So I called them up and the rest is history. I did uh, family portraits for five years for this company all over the United States. Uh, but I only work four hours a day, so the rest of the time, that's when I started shooting landscapes and, uh, and fishing. <laughs> when you only work four hours a day, you've got a lot of spare time. <laughs> so that's it, and I became very aware of light and the land and how it lit things, how things looked at different times of the day. I made a collection of a bunch of photographs from photographic magazines that I thought the light was exquisite the compositions and everything was what I was looking for in my head. And that's what I've been striving still to this day, is chasing the light. And, uh, and that's what I do, chase the light. Uh, my daughter told me, Dad, you need to be on social media. And I said, what for? And she said, well, you'll get a lot of customers out of there. And I said, okay, you do it. Here's some pictures, you do it. And so for five years, she put my stuff on a Facebook page. And it had very little interest, maybe 15, 20 people would view the day, and then she decided to have a family and said, Dad, I'm done, it's all yours in three weeks. Here's how you do it. And when I started looking at the aspects of social media, I said, well, people may want to hear some of the stories about some of these photographs. So I started writing stories about how I got the photographs. And it went from, you know, maybe 30 or 40 views every three or four days to hundreds and hundreds of views and more questions about photography. And that whole thing is blowing up now. Uh, two months ago, there was a half a million views on that. And that's generated additional interest all around the world. With the Palouse book, I get questions, is that book still available? And I have to tell them no. And, uh, now I can tell them we're going to do another edition. So social media does have an advantage sometimes. I don't pursue it a lot. Uh, I've worked with a young man in the back back there on the, on the Wallula book. And that was a great adventure to do all that. I had to spend a lot of time in Wallula Gap, where the Great River Bends, as we call it. And uh, I spent a lot of time. Uh, with rattlesnakes and <laughs> everything else crawling around the bluff down at Wallula on both sides of the river. Now most of those areas aren't accessible. And so I was glad I was able to, to access some of that property when it was available. The Palouse has changed drastically since I started in 83. Many of the classic barns that I photographed in 83 are no longer there or are in such bad disrepair. Ready to fall down. 
So it's been a, a, a wonderful adventure. The Lord has blessed me way beyond my dreams that I had as being a photographer. When you first think I'm going to be a photographer, you think of the magazines and the girls and all this other stuff. And that never really uh, materialized for me. I love being outdoors and alone. And it's, it's all about God's creation and capturing the light with it and sharing that with people. So it stimulates an emotion within them that attaches them to the land, to that photograph. And uh, that's one story I hear, heard constantly when I used to do a lot of art shows. When they're looking at a picture, they will say, that reminds me of when I was 11 years old and my dad took me fishing on the river. And that was a real special time. And so that's that's the kind of images I like to try to catch where people can actually put themselves in that spot. And with the agriculture, it's the same thing. You know, it reminds farmers of the great job that they do and the hard work that they do, and you know, all the lives that they provide for that people don't even think about. It, so. Great. All right. Thank you, John. Terrific. Okay. As, uh, as we close, I wanted to uh, finish with uh, the last image here on, uh, on my bucket list is the Mars Gate in uh, Reims, France. It's the largest Roman gate in existence. And the Romans were famous for celebrating battles and generals. You know, that, that, that's kind of the main thing on their menu. What's really interesting about this image is that this is a gate that is dedicated to peace and farming. And when you look in the uh, inside of it, in these, uh, in the arches, you see examples of uh, Corrine, I'm having trouble here getting this thing going. You see examples of actually farming technology because there are pictures of, uh, there are pictures, I'll get it here eventually. Okay. Uh, there's, there's, there's pictures of size, there's pictures of sickles, and this is the first ever image in the center, top of the arch, of a mechanical harvester. Now imagine, this is back in the third century. Uh, it's a pretty primitive harvester, but it is a mechanical harvester. I was uh, thinking, <coughs> excuse me, I was thinking about what did they face in the third century? I mean, there were struggles. You, you, you all know enough about Rome to know that it was ultimately barbarian invasions that overwhelmed them. Dependence on slave labor. Political corruption, sound familiar? I mean, you know, th these are recurrent themes. But then let's look at what we face in the 21st century. This is defined as planetary high risks. John was telling us about changes he's seen in the land. Biodiversity collapse, global warming, biochemical changes to land and water. We're, we're, we're facing another set of unprecedented challenges that we need our best minds to care about to make sure the next generation flourishes as <clears throat> I think our grandparents were, were hoping their children and grandchildren would. So uh, I'm grateful for the chance to look at you, with you at some of these images that are just kind of touchstones to important topics like that. Uh, really uh, grateful for the chance to come and if you have questions for me and John we're close to the end of our hour here but uh, if you uh, care for us to respond to anything we'd be happy to do so. Thank you again for the chance to be here.